I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. So David, two weeks ago, you kind of uh, let us know what we were going to be talking about today. And that's the new summary of the 1500 page report. We're still waiting to be published, authored by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES for short. This is the IPCC of biodiversity. So, where the IPCC deals with climate change, this, you know, where we are today and what we need to do to mitigate. This deals with uh, the interconnectedness that is our Earth life system and where it is and how much it's degraded and what we might possibly do to reverse those effects. This report is 17 years in the making, um, authored by over 500 people, which does not include the thousands of peer-reviewed research papers that it cites. And so we're just going to be kind of going through some of the bullet points that are covered in the summary until we can get to a, a larger show on the full report. Throw in some rants in there, David, and then close out. Yeah, I'm here for the rants, and I'm sure everyone else is as well. Uh, we wish we could have that full show on the entire report. I'm sure there's some gems in there, but uh, as we mentioned in that update show a couple weeks ago, that that won't be out for at least another six months. Uh, we'll see when they finally get the full thing finished and published. But until then, there is a lot of information, even in this little 39-page summary. And uh, there's a lot of stuff to go over, and there's a lot of depressing things in here, even in their attempts to try and and cheer it up uh, and make it palatable to all the policymakers and business people of the world. But this is is important stuff. And I honestly think that even though this is not as popular as the IPCC report, which, uh, I mean, it's easy to talk about, Daniel, in terms of what the effects of the world will be when you're just looking at a single thing and and taking that single thing and using that as a public metric of where we are. And that single thing, of course, is the temperature. How hot are we right now? And related to that is, you know, the carbon level. Uh, In fact, today, I think we crossed over 415 parts per million. I saw a lot of articles about that. And, And so it's an easy thing for people to watch, engage, and instantly see where we are in this process. But when you're talking about things like ecosystems, the environment, all the nature that is on this earth, that's a lot more difficult to quantify, to track, and to stay up to date with. But arguably, this is a much larger impact on each and every one of our lives. So much of our everyday world depends on the success of these ecosystems. And the report does go into that, and we'll mention a little bit about how that's the case uh, throughout this episode. But this is the big one. This is the most important report that science has put out in terms of the future of humanity, if we have one, that has probably ever been compiled in the history of humanity. And and I I don't want to undersell this in any way. This is the report. If you only read one thing, if you only ever get one thing out of this entire show, it's this report and the findings in it. But you should keep listening. (laughs) Assuming that the report gets it right. Assuming that that the report is right. And assuming they, they encompass everything and assuming that their recommendations truly uh, paint a path forward that's acceptable and, and adequate. Well, I guess we'll have to see about that. Right. We did have problems with that IPCC report. I feel like this is foreshadowing. Maybe something we can rant on. So, uh, okay, let's jump right in, David. Uh, let me read from the report now. Past and ongoing rapid declines in biodiversity, ecosystem functions, and many of nature's contributions to people mean that most international societal and environmental goals, such as those embodied in the Aichi Biodiversity Targets and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, will not be achieved based on current trajectories. These declines will also undermine other goals, such as those specified in the Paris Agreement adopted under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the 2050 Vision for Biodiversity. The negative trends in biodiversity and ecosystem functions are projected to continue or worsen in many future scenarios in response to indirect drivers such as rapid human population growth, unsustainable production and consumption, and associated technological development. 
So, David, it sounds like we are really off track. <laughs> Who would have guessed? The sustainable development goals that they mentioned, those were signed by all United Nation member states in 2015. It tracks 17 different global goals for battling climate change, habitat loss, economic inequality, sustainable cities, all these things, and all for the purpose of achieving peace and prosperity for people and the planet. Going back to this report, according to IPBES, we are going to fail almost all of them. Quote, Taking into consideration that the Sustainable Development Goals are integrated and indivisible, as well as implemented nationally, current negative trends in biodiversity and ecosystems will undermine progress towards 80%, 35 out of 44, of the assessed targets of goals related to poverty, hunger, health, water, cities, climate, oceans, and land. Uh... All right, so with those bad news out of the way, David, let's jump into some of the specifics of this bad news. This is my favorite part, Daniel, and it's time for a little statistics. Stats and facts. Here we go. Uh, This is all since 1980. In this time, up till now, and again, this report is recent, so up till 2018, global population has exploded, while per capita consumption has increased by 15%. So that means not only are there more of us, each and every one of us is consuming more than we were in the past. Greenhouse gas emissions in the same period have doubled. Plastic waste floating in the ocean has increased tenfold. Since the 1990s, urban land has doubled. And urban land and land use in particular is one of the major factors in land degradation, all the disasters, this environment. 80% of current wastewater is dumped without any treatment at all. Just This is sewage, this is fertilizer runoff, this is industrial, whatever, it's just dumped. A third of the Earth's land and 75% of freshwater sources have been converted to sites of food production. So this means less and less of the land on this Earth is being left in its natural state. And natural state, of course, is a state with these natural ecosystems and environments and the animals that depend on all of that. But it's not just surviving and living our lives that's doing all this. Some of our entertainment has negatively impacted all of the Earth and its ecosystems. Due to the rapid development of infrastructure and transportation routes, the carbon footprint from tourism has jumped 40% in the four years following 2009, and an estimated 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions come solely from tourism. I suppose that's kind of a snapshot of some, some human activity. And so if we look at some of the effects of all this, including climate change. The report lays out some things that we should expect. In terms of species loss, one million plant and animal species are at risk of extinction, and that represents about 25% of all species in the animal and plant groups that researchers happened to examine. In the past century alone, the average abundance of native life, according to the report, has fallen by over 20%. 85 percent of the Earth's wetlands have disappeared over the past 300 years. Biomass of wild mammals around the world has fallen 82 percent since just 1970. By 2014, 97 percent of the entire ocean was being impacted by human activity, and over half is currently being uh, fished through industrial means, and about a third of all fisheries are overfished in the ocean. Seagrass, one of the best sequesters of carbon in the world, David, declined 30% uh, between 1970 and 2000. Coral reefs, the most productive ecosystems in the world, half of all of them have disappeared in the past century and a half. Some 40% of all amphibians are at risk of extinction. I mean, this list goes on and on. We're not even scratching the surface here. Yeah, I I remember reading early on in the report, Daniel, actually a quarter of all species that are currently known on Earth are facing extinction because of our actions. One in four. Could you imagine if there was something threatening one in four people, like what the response to that would be? Well, when it's all these species that we depend on for our livelihood, uh, for the survival of our civilization, well, that we just ignore it, I guess. And really, there's no way for us to anticipate that. It really is is incomprehensible. I mean, we don't even know all the species. We haven't cataloged all the species that live on this planet. I've I've seen estimates that we know anywhere from like 10% to 1% of all species on this planet. 
we have no idea what losing that amount of species means in terms of, of biodiversity and in terms of the way ecosystems function. I mean, this is something we've talked about. Everything is interconnected. One insect species goes away and all of a sudden a whole uh, a food chain collapses. All of a sudden our food can't grow because we don't have those pollinators. There's so many unpredictable consequences of loss that we just have no way to anticipate. And that, of course, is just identifying these species that we do know about. Like you mentioned, how many species have we already completely lost and never knew were there in the first place? All these ecosystem niches that they filled have been totally destroyed. And we're seeing instead this homogenization of the species of the earth. And this is actually one thing the report talks about, how not only are we losing so much life around the world, we're losing a lot of the variety. And it's being replaced by more and more of the same, which sets us up to be more and more fragile. Because as we've talked about before, single species are highly susceptible to single pathogens, to single vectors of death, and they can wipe out entire things all at once instead of small localized packets. Um, there's, there's so many different ways that this loss of life can impact us negatively. It's hard to catalog them all, and these, these connections are difficult to impossible to see until things really start to fall apart. David, I, uh, I forgot. I, I meant to mention in the beginning, like before we started, that if the listener was having a bad day or a bad week, maybe, you know, skip this episode for now. It's kind of depressing. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a good, good idea. This one might be worth skipping, but come back to it eventually. C- come back to it when you're uh, feeling good, feeling, well, then we might bring them down. Maybe it's better to listen to this when you're already feeling down. But you have like something really fun planned afterwards. Yeah, that way you can come back up. Yeah, self-care. Yeah, all right. Works out. Um, and so all these things, you know, that we've, we've seen so far, this destruction, almost all of this has been a result of direct human activity, whether that's our construction and development, logging and fishing, resource extraction, you know, from the soil, from fisheries, all these things. But we're in the turning point where the future is going to be much, much more grim than, than this because climate change will just put exponentially compounding pressure on species' abilities to survive. And all these direct human interventions into nature will, will have that much more of an impact because climate change is going to make everything more fragile as habitats shrink, as things change so fast that, that species have a harder time adapting. And the fact that they're already struggling because of all this direct human activity just means that climate change is really going to take things over the top. Well, I've already started alluding to this a little bit so far, Daniel, where, yeah, we have all this loss in these ecosystems, but these ecosystems that we're losing also impact us. It's not just these things living off by themselves. We're served by all these things we defined as ecosystem services, which is a very pragmatic way at looking at how these ecosystems interact with their own civilization and society. And I don't like it totally all the time because it sort of tries to quantify the effect and the usefulness of various ecosystems, but it is important in understanding these larger system ideas of how we interact with the ecosystems, which all interact with the earth and everything comes together. Um, and there is a lot of value in that. And, and ecosystem services also serve ecosystems themselves. It's not just a human relationship. Um, but, but these are ultimately what starts causing the huge loss of life. Because when these ecosystems start failing in their services, then you see these cascading effects around the world that ultimately affect not just the ecosystems, but human civilization as well. So let's talk about a little bit of these. And the report goes into a lot here. Well, I think you're right about there's somewhat problematic language in quantifying ecosystem services. And we did talk about this a little bit more in depth in episode 34, Irreplaceable. But ecosystem services, this is how all life on Earth is supported. This is the foundation, right? We can't live without the services that nature provides. And so trying to quantify it into a dollar figure is problematic. But from the report, it's estimated that in North and South America, Ecosystem services provide $24 trillion worth of annual value, which, again, it's a little bit misleading if you're thinking like an economist, because to them, you know, putting a price on something means that, you know, you could take something like breathable air, exchange it for $24 trillion and call it a wash. But obviously, that doesn't really make sense, right? But it could be useful to conceptualize how a dollar figure can be put on nature, the natural world absorbs roughly 60% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions, for example. 
And that acts as downward pressure on global temperatures, which then decreases the risk of something like a deadly hurricane. And the coastal ecosystems that we have, like coral reefs and mangrove forests, these mitigate the risk of inland flooding. So when Hurricane Harvey came in and devastated Houston, Texas, in addition to a number of other places, to the tune of $125 billion, which they are still recovering from and probably will never fully recover from, if there's a particular ecosystem that we could say can prevent a Hurricane Harvey, then we might say that's worth at least $125 billion, right? Math checks out. Another really great example for ecosystems that give us a huge amount of ecosystem services, Daniel, is wetlands. And this is one of the most endangered ecosystems around the world today. I think at the report, it mentioned that up to three quarters of these are gone at this point. So wetlands serve a variety of roles. They will help things like that storm surge that was so deadly in so many of these hurricanes that have struck and caused such giant bills. Uh, they filter the water that we drink. If destroying a wetland to build a residential neighborhood results in the need for a $3 million water treatment facility, well then we can take a look at this ecosystem service as having a value of at least $3 million because that wetland was saving us from having to construct this thing. Um, of course, I think maybe somebody who's pragmatic would say, well, that also prevented us from creating $3 million worth of jobs. So who's really the winner here? But I mean, obviously, figures like these <laughs> are only looking at the most basic, easily quantifiable version of this calculation. And uh, it leaves out all this other stuff. They're hopelessly undervalued. Nature is invaluable. Anybody who stood there and looked at something can say there, there is no price for this. Like destroying this, there is no value that is worth this. Um, at least anybody who has a heart. Uh, maybe a developer might say something different. Uh, but, I mean, even beyond that, if we got rid of this nature, then that means we're ultimately dooming ourselves to a destroyed world. And in that case, you could say the value is essentially infinite. Well, David, we're dealing with dollars, figures here. And as long as we're going to put a dollar figure on nature, we should take the discounted present value, which any good economist would do, which is you just take all future returns of something, discount it to the present value based on uh, interest rates and all that. And the dollar figure for nature would still be infinite because in the long run, we're all dead without it. So yeah, uh, there, there you go. This is the economic defense for my rambling. <laughs> you intuited it correctly. <laughs> well, uh, this report did a much better job calculating this stuff out than, than I did right here. Uh, they considered data from over 2000 studies on various ecosystem services. They grouped nature's contributions to people in 18 different categories, ranging from things like habitat creation, air and water filtration, to things that you wouldn't necessarily think of at first, like cultural services. And they found that of these 18 categories, 14 of them, or 77%, are currently in decline. And that's a threat to everything that we know in this world. One of the things that uh, biodiversity and ecosystem decline threatens is the agriculture, the very food that we eat to sustain ourselves as a modern civilization, David. Of all the domesticated species and breeds of animals that humans use for agricultural food production, 25% of them are either gone or going extinct. This reveals how biodiversity loss means economic losses to the food industry, but more importantly, an increased risk of disease, zoonotic diseases, which we talked about, which originate in animals before ultimately jumping to humans. It, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, David, how agriculture... You know, problems in agriculture can increase the risk of disease for humans, but uh, this is something we touched on in episode 20, our episode on, you know, pathogens, which is zoonotic diseases are a class of diseases that originate in animals before they jump to humans. And these... I thought it was zoonotic. <laughs> I'm going to have to edit that. Yeah. Uh, zoonotic diseases are... Uh, responsible for 17% of all infectious diseases, so that, causing 700,000 deaths every year. And that's going to only accelerate as our livestock animals become less and less diverse, which means we're, we will have to apply an even greater number of antibiotics, which, as we talked about in that episode, will cause the proliferation of antimicrobial resistant strains of pathogens. In fact, if I remember, one of the most resistant bacterial uh, gene going around that's, that's entering all these different pathogens came from, most likely, from a pig farm in which, you know, this antimicrobial resistance was allowed to 
uh, kind of incubate itself because of all this, you know, condensed industrial animal raising that we're doing. And uh, obviously the loss of diversity in there is only going to uh, make that worse. But maybe, Daniel, we can get people more interested if we identify some of these crops that might be lost or threatened by these ecosystem services, by the disaster that's happening all around us. I mean, 75% of global food crop types, including fruits and vegetables, and like I said, some of these most important cash crops, which include things like coffee, cocoa, almonds, all these rely on that animal pollination that is now being threatened by this loss of life and diversity. Reminds me of the papaya uh, disease that like destroyed the Hawaiian economy several years ago because there was no diversity. The papaya disease? Yeah, do, do you remember that? You know, Hawaii grows all our papaya. It's not very genetically diverse, and there's this fungus or some kind of pathogen that just came through and just destroyed so much of their production. I think it's still a problem, but they're working through it. Well, I, I know we talked about the, the loss of all one type of banana, the old, more delicious type of banana, because everything was a the big mic. monoculture, yeah. And the current banana, uh, what is it, the Cavendish, is now being threatened by a similar disease. And uh, they are worried that the current clones of bananas that exist all over the world will also all be wiped out. So uh, you can see very quickly how these non-diverse populations can be threatened very rapidly. Which means uh, our culture is threatened. Right. You know, like in cartoons, David, when you see a person, uh, they're walking and there's a, a banana peel on the ground and they step on it and they slip and fall. In the future, kids won't know what they're slipping on. Well, but even going back to the, the banana that went extinct, the whole reason that joke exists is because bananas from the past, I think maybe it was the big mic that everyone loved. That peel was actually slippery, but our current bananas don't have slippery peels. So if you actually like think about it, it doesn't really make sense. No, I've slipped on a banana. I've legitimately slipped on a banana peel. Oh, you have? Like, if you drop it with the fruit side down, it's kind of like gooey and slushy, and I've slipped on that. Okay, I redact my point. Or maybe you're just clumsy. To- I'm, I'm definitely clumsy. Um, okay, back on topic. I want to come back to this point, though, about the loss of domesticated animals. Um, this is something I hadn't really thought about, but the report states, quote, Globally, local varieties and breeds of domesticated plants and animals are disappearing. This loss of diversity, including genetic diversity, poses a serious risk to global food security by undermining the resilience of many agricultural systems to threats such as pests, pathogens, and climate change. End quote. And I wanted to come back to this because it reminds me of something that Wendell Berry wrote uh, in one of his books about what goes on in adapting a flock of sheep to a single farm. And I think this is really important because for us city folk, David, uh, who think Cheerios grow from trees, we need more reminding of just how complex and involved local adaptation really is. And this comes from an essay entitled, Let the Farm Judge. Our farm in the lower Kentucky River Valley is mostly on hillsides. Heavy animals tend to damage hillsides, especially in winter. Our experience with brood cows showed us that our farm needs sheep. It needs, in addition, sheep that can make their living by grazing coarse pasture on hillsides. And so, in the fall of 1978, we bought six border Cheviot ewes and a buck. Our choice of breed was a good one. The border Cheviot is a hill sheep, developed to make good use of such rough pastures as we have. Moreover, it can make good use of a little corn, and our farm is capable of producing a little corn. There have been problems, of course. Some of them have had to do with adapting ourselves to our breed. For us, at any rate, the inevitable source of breeding stock has been the Midwest, and many of our problems have been traceable to that fact. What I am going to say implies no fault in the Midwestern breeders, to whom we and our breed have an enormous debt. It is nevertheless true that, For a flock of sheep, living is easier in the prairie lands than on a Kentucky hillside. Just walking around on a hillside farm involves more strain and requires more energy. And the less fertile the land, the farther a ewe will have to walk to fill her belly. Knees that might have remained sound on the gentle topography of Ohio or Iowa may become arthritic 
at our place. Also, a ewe that would have twin lambs on a prairie farm may have only one on a hill farm. Similarly, a lamb will grow to slaughter weight more slowly where he has to allocate more energy to getting around. We once sold five yearling ewes to our friend Bob Willerton in Danvers, Illinois, where on their first lambing they produced 11 lambs. On our farm, they might have produced seven or eight. We have noticed the same difference with coal ewes that we have sent to our son's farm, which is less steep and more fertile than ours. Our farm, then, is asking for a ewe that can stay healthy, live long, breed successfully, have two lambs without assistance, and feed them well in comparatively demanding circumstances. Experience has shown us that the Border Cheviot breed is capable of producing a ewe of this kind, but that it does not do so inevitably. In 18 years, and out of a good many ewes bought or raised, we have identified so far only two ewe families, the female descendants of two ewes, that fairly dependably perform as we and our place require. Um, So I'm going to pause right there and just reflect on the fact that, so it took him 18 years upon initially purchasing this breed of sheep to select for just two individuals that can give birth to uh, individuals that are locally adapted to his farm such that they reach optimal productivity. And it just goes to show how complex and how specialized and how unique a local environment truly is. Uh, He goes on to write about the ways these uh, ewes now perform on his farm, which I'm going to skip back to the essay, quote, the point is that, especially now when grain feeding and confinement feeding are so common, no American breeder should expect any breed to be locally adapted. Breeders should recognize that from the standpoint of local adaptation and cheap production, every purchase of a breeding animal is a gamble. A newly purchased ewe or buck may improve the performance of your flock on your farm, or it may not. Good breeders will know, or they will soon find out, that theirs is not the only judgment that is involved. While the breeder is judging, the breeder's farm also is judging, enforcing its demands and making selections. And this is as it should be. I think about this story a lot. Anytime we hear about how some new technology is going to radically reshape, agriculture in in a whole country or anytime I hear about some new seed being developed by someone in a white uh, lab coat and I remind myself that the real work in developing farms, in stewarding land, in protecting species, in selecting for breeds that are going to be uh, resistant to climate change, this happens on the ground by people who are working that ground, who are living in that ground, who depend on the things that that ground produces. That's where that work goes on. And these big commercial products can only paint over that. And it would be a mistake, and it has been a mistake, to continue marginalizing the people who are doing this very important work. But back to agriculture, David, continue. Another point made by the IP Bez report concerning agriculture is that the diversity of nature and our relationship to nature is interconnected. Quote, For example, clearing of forests for agriculture has increased the provision of food and feed and other materials important for people, such as natural fibers and ornamental flowers, but has reduced contributions as diverse as pollination, climate regulation, water quality regulation, opportunities for learning and inspiration, and the maintenance of options for the future. Land degradation has reduced productivity in 23% of global terrestrial areas and 235 to 577 billion dollars in annual global crop output is at risk as a result of pollinator loss, uh, end quote. And I, I think it's funny that they worked in there that materials important for people include ornamental flowers, but... Uh, Big flower, David. That's the industry. They're the ones. Oh, yeah. It says right right here on this, this, uh, this report, sponsored by 1-800-Flowers.com, so... <laughs> I mean, we joke, but... This is something that these reports actually do a good job of is including the fact that we get cultural significance from nature. And it's so easy to discount that in our very you know, money-driven technocratic societies where we don't really care about these sentimental things. We only care about the dollars and, and the returns and all this. But you know, it reminds me of episode uh, FUBAR where we had Sophia Perez on and she talks about 
the the ancestral land that is going to be bombed by the U.S. military and, and how devastating that is for communities and how they get so much value from this island that, you know, they're connected to. And it's just another reminder that we're so disconnected from the land. Um, okay, so we hit agriculture, we hit ecosystem services. Uh, there's one other broad category I think we should hit from this summary, and it's what the IPCC has done fairly well, at least and you know, we should give them credit for mentioning in this report as well, that indigenous people around the world, um, marginal people, are threatened by all of these things, whether that's climate change or ecosystem loss, right? The great injustice of global destruction is that the people who have contributed least to the problem suffer the most. This is the great injustice of our global civilization, which is made possible through capital accumulation. That's that the wealth of the few is funneled upwards through exploitation and the barbaric treatment of the many. Yet when the hurricanes come, when the drought arrives, when wildfires, famine, disease, when these things spread, all is a direct result of this very system of wealth extraction. The ones who will be hit first are those who are already enslaved by this system. That means poor minorities in Miami being forced onto land previously grabbed by private developers, but now vulnerable to coastal flooding from rising seas, like we discussed in episode two. It means people in the tropics reeling from crop failure or having to face climate-induced tsunamis and typhoons. It means towns and villages dependent on fisheries for their sustenance and livelihoods going broke and hungry from ocean acidification and overfishing as discussed in episodes 6 and 42. It's no wonder, David, that all these international treaties and these coming togethers of world leaders result in failure. It's no wonder that we're completely off track on any sustainable development goals, any Paris Agreement nonsense, because none of those people are first in line to experience the horrible effects of the destruction that they are the principal cause of. Those who suffer most have no seat at the table. They have no voice that reaches the ears of power. And how much cruelty is born from all that, Daniel? From all that want that's inflicted on these people? Because that is where cruelty is born, from want. From those who want something because they don't have the things they need, as well as those on the top who want more even though they have everything they could possibly imagine. All of this is what creates cruelty. And for some reason, we've decided that we want to have a system That not only enables want to happen, but depends on it for its very survival. And so we've decided collectively, I guess, that by by having this want-based system, that we also want to create a system that allows all this cruelty to exist. And in fact, that cruelty is an important component of that system in the first place. But uh, I think I'm getting distracted here. Um, To turn back to the report just for a second. You're so right, Daniel, that the people who are most impacted by all of these tragedies, both climate and ecosystem related, are the ones that are most vulnerable. Uh, and, And the report goes into this at great length. Areas of the world projected to experience significant negative effects from global changes in that climate, the biodiversity, these ecosystem functions, and ultimately nature's contribution to people are also home, of course, to the large concentrations of indigenous people and many of the world's poorest populations. Because of their strong dependency on nature and its contributions for their subsistence, livelihoods, and health, these communities will be disproportionately hard hit by the negative changes that are happening right now and will come and increase as time goes on. These negative effects also influence the ability of these indigenous peoples and local communities to manage and conserve wild and domesticated biodiversity and nature's contribution to the people. Indigenous peoples and local communities have been proactively confronting these challenges in partnership with each other and with an array of other stakeholders for a very long time through co-management systems, local and regional monitoring networks, and by ultimately revitalizing and adapting these systems to work for their local environment. Meanwhile, these regional and global scenarios that we're constantly discussing in places like the West, well, they oftentimes lack an explicit consideration of the views, perspective, and rights of the indigenous people and local communities who have the most knowledge and understanding of large regions and ecosystems that their own future depends upon. There's a great irony here, too, because it's not just that we should, you know, morally speaking, care about inequality because it's the right thing to do, which we should, but also 
if industrial methods are the ones destroying the world, then our future rests on those who maintain and cultivate holistic and sustainable methods of stewardship, which is more often than not found in indigenous populations. In fact, according to the report, almost all of the wild species of plants and animals that are left on this, on this planet, on our land, those are found in regions stewarded by indigenous people. I want to read something that Wendell Berry wrote. Quote, the loss of local culture is, in part, a practical loss and an economic one. For one thing, such a culture contains and conveys to succeeding generations the history of the use of the place and the knowledge of how the place may be lived in and used. For another, the pattern of reminding implies affection for the place and respect for it. And so, finally, the local culture will carry the knowledge of how the place may be well and lovingly used, and also the implicit command to use it only well and lovingly. The only true and effective operator's manual for Spaceship Earth is not a book that any human will ever write. It is hundreds of thousands of local cultures. End quote. And David, I think we can go even further than that because many of the things that we enjoy today came directly from indigenous and local groups. Their methods merely being appropriated uh, by corporations and, and this new model of economics. I want to play a couple clips from a, a talk given by Leah Penniman, um, who wrote a book called Farming While Black. And in this talk, she discusses how much of the innovation in agriculture came from the black farmers of Africa and the black farmers of the American South that were used as slaves and and how much we take for granted in their contribution to the modern way that we view agriculture. My grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd, in the 1700s, um, was one of the 12 and a half million skilled farmers who were kidnapped from their home and taken across the Atlantic Ocean to work for no pay on plantations in what is now the United States, the Caribbean, South America. And these farmers, particularly the women in the community, had foresight. They said, we don't know where we're going. We're not getting any any report backs, but we know that people are being kidnapped all around us and that our future is uncertain. What is most precious to us? And so they gathered up the okra, the millet, the cowpea, the black rice, the agusi melon, the sorghum, and all the seed that they'd been keeping for generations, and they braided it into their hair. They hid it because they believed against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on soil, and they believed that they would have descendants who needed to inherit that seed. Their example is what allows us, even in the midst of really challenging times, not to give up on our descendants. So let's talk about what was in those seeds. My sister made this incredible painting um, called Foresight about that moment of braiding, And anyone who has a braiding tradition in their family knows that while you sit and get your locks brushed out, you know, and the oils added and the braids added, um, there's stories that get transmitted. There's culture and there's song that gets passed down. And in that deep, deep knowledge of how to be in right relationship with the earth was transmitted. Um, So things like okra and Egyptian spinach, cotton, sesame, the black-eyed pea, eggplants, melons, rice, kale, Amara kale specifically, gourd, uh, hamayaka or sorrel, spice basil, scented geranium, coffee, palm, kola nut, tamarind, these are all crops that came in the seed braids. And then there are many, many more crops that were adapted. So the Georgia rattlesnake melon or green glazed collard that were adapted by enslaved Africans. So many of the crops that we grow have those origins. David, we mentioned that indigenous groups and exploited populations do not have a seat at the table of power, right? And one consequence of this is that societies, our cities, our towns, our populations of people, they've been collapsing and disappearing all around us, but we don't always notice because those voices are not being heard, right? It's easy to conceptualize the idea of the collapse of civilization as some future event, right? Some clear moment where everything changes, something that we can prepare for. But in fact, I think, you know, as you've 
mention, I think we've talked about, is it's more of a slow, gradual process through which one day we're going to look around us and realize that the ecosystem services that we rely on, the agricultural groups that we have come to depend on for food, these faded away long before we even noticed. And it will be too late to get them back. But we didn't notice. We won't notice because when an economy is served through global extraction, the collapse of any one link in the supply chain just shifts extraction somewhere else. As we discussed in episode 22 about fast fashion, that industry resulted in a literal building collapse in Bangladesh in 2013, in which 1,000 exploited workers were killed. But that meant nothing to the clothing giants like H&M, Zara, all these, all these companies. And if you were a consumer walking around the mall in America at the time, you would not notice anything different because the supply chain just shifted to another factory. It's the same thing going on with whole cultures, with whole people, like the dis- diaspora, diaspora. Diaspora. <laughs> They're t- like the diaspora in the Mariana Islands that Sophia Perez discussed, or entire ways of preserving species, such as community-run seed banks in Eastern Africa that we talked about in episode 52. Or it could be communities in Alabama that are dying right now from hookworm because the state cannot afford to keep its citizens safe and healthy. Collapse is occurring all around us for, for people who those in power have decided are worth leaving behind. We only don't notice the effects because we're not paying attention because our economy will continue to serve us, will continue to extract from this earth, from its people, from its land, until there is nothing left. David, I've got some counter arguments, though, I want to throw at you and see how you respond, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm in the hot seat. Let's go. All right. Uh, counter, counterpoint one. Well, we've been fine so far, so uh, life always finds a way. We'll be okay. You're right. Things will go on perfectly for forever. <laughs> Technology will save the day. I have no, no counter argument here. Um, uh, Self-driving cars will reduce gl- uh, greenhouse gas emissions. They'll drive around pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. And, and it'll be awesome. There will be little engines in our cars that do like direct uh, air capture, uh, carbon capture and storage. Yeah, and it um, sequesters it in like little like rabbit droppings. You can just bury them when you see them. Uh, no, I mean, this is this is a question or, or a statement that, that I hear all the time, not just in relation to this report, um, like you just asked me here, but in, in terms of what the show talks about all the time, like, oh, you know, things aren't going to collapse. People have been predicting the end of the world for forever. It's always going on. Uh, what makes it different this time? I mean, why do you think you're right and, and all these thousands of other people for thousands of years haven't been? And I, I mean, how can you say that? Is This is what I was responding. Like, how can you say that when you look around the world today? Like, the world has changed so dramatically. Our effect on the world has changed so dramatically. Who before in human history has been able to quite literally destroy entire cities with a single weapon? Who before in history has been able to reshape mountains and move them somewhere else? Who before in history have been able to travel halfway around the world or entirely around the world in just a couple of hours? I mean, the amount of power that we've accumulated as a species is unimaginable. And in that same process, the amount of us who make up this species is also unfathomable compared to anything that we've seen in human history before. There is so much biomass, so much weight around the world that is either directly human from our massive 7 billion population to the huge amount of resources we pulled out of the earth, concrete that we built up, metal that ties all of our civilizations together. We've reshaped this earth. You can see it from space. And we've looked down on earth for the first time in history and can contemplate this fact. And, and of course, we see these things falling apart now all around us. And, and you can sit there and say, well, what, what makes it different this time? Have you had your eyes closed? Uh, things are rapidly degrading. There are places, even within these, these non-collapsed areas, that are in collapse. We've talked about this before in terms of the poverty that we've seen even here in the United States, where one and a half million households still live on less than $2 a day, where there are open sewage pits in southern Alabama that the UN has declared worse than many developing nations around the world, that this is the most intense poverty that they've ever seen. Here at home in the United States, this place that's supposed to be a, a unimaginably wealthy country. If you don't believe collapse is happening, it's because you're privileged. And of course, if you're listening to this podcast, you are privileged. The very nature that you have access to this shows that you and I and everybody listening 
are the ones doing the damage to this earth, unfortunately. It's a fact that we have to face. And we can limit that and we can try and, and, and back that up, but but Well, David. I'm getting off track here, aren't I? No, I just I just don't want to uh discount that person who had to download this podcast, put it on like a uh what are those tracks, those things called? The thing that came before CDs. What are they called? Tape. Yeah, a tape rec- an eight track. Tape rec- yeah, an eight track and you're not you're not that young, Daniel. You should know what a tape player is. <laughs> a discus. Um, Keep going. Sorry. Well, I mean, like, I am getting off track here. And the point is, is, is this is different this time because we've never had this much power to affect our world in human history. And in human history, we've defined our ability in accumulating power as using it for a destructive tool. And since we haven't been destroying ourselves directly, at least on a giant scale, at least for the past few decades, we've turned that energy to the earth. And we've been doing a pretty damn good job destroying it. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything to add to that other than the fact of just, you know, the, the trends that are going on, the impact we're having on the earth is exponential. From the report, quote, in the past 50 years, the human population has doubled. The global economy has grown nearly fourfold and global trade has grown tenfold, together driving up the demands for energy and materials, end quote. 50 years, David. That's just a tremendous amount of change. That's less than a generation. And this is the danger of exponential growth. This is something we talked about in depth in our episode on on population growth, impacts of growth, I believe it's called, which is with exponential growth, everything is fine. And then all of a sudden, everything collapses. I know that kind of counters what I said about slow collapse, but because the bulk of the damage occurs at the very end, that is, if you chip away at something at a rate that doubles every year, That means each and every year you have an impact equal to the combined sum impact of every single year up until that point. Year 10 will produce an impact equal to the sum of years one through nine, right? And so to to respond to this diversity loss catastrophe by saying, well, we've been fine so far, I'm sure we'll find a way, that's to be hopelessly short-sighted because what's right around the corner is greater than anything... Anything we have ever experienced in the history of human civilization in terms of energy output, in terms of just about every single human impact uh, thing you can track. All right, let, let me hit you with another one, David. Okay. I like this. This is fun. The Earth, David, goes through lots of cycles. Uh, species go extinct. Life adapts. And mm-hmm. humans are just another variable in the changing nature of the earth and the life around it will adapt <laughs> um this is another one i mean after all we've had uh hot hot periods right that's true hot periods cold periods this could just be natural variations in the sun and in fact don't you know we're about to enter the maunder minimum daniel and uh, we're going to actually be not a uh, climate crisis of heat but one of cold and ice age is coming. Um, or at least that's what I've read on certain blogs online that I would not recommend checking out. Um, this is another one I, I, I hear a lot. And uh, it, it sort of steps into this strange place. Well, do we see ourselves humans as stewards of the world? Um, is it our job to try and protect all these species? Or should we let Darwin come in and, and save the day? And, and that idea that, you know, if these animals can't cut it, well, then they shouldn't be here in the first place is uh, such a naive idea, and it's one that really shows a lack of understanding of evolution and also just how rapidly we're changing things. The pace of this mass extinction that we're currently in the midst of, and, and how crazy is it actually, Daniel, just to reflect on that for a moment, that they, we're all sitting here you know, recording this show right now, and everybody's sitting around listening. Maybe you're driving in your car, maybe you're at work, um, and just like casually going on about our lives while we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction on Earth. You know, The other ones were like comets come down and blow up the Earth, and or there's like giant lava traps happening in, in Siberia that, that's changing everything, or, or whatever it is that is decimating life on Earth. Um, and... And we're in the midst of that right now. And everybody's just going on like nothing is happening. Um, And not only that, I mean, this is one of the fastest rates of extinction that has ever happened. What is it? It's 10,000 times faster than the background rate. And it's just increasing as time goes on. And so, no, you know, these things aren't naturally evolutionary processes. The effects that we're having, those massive effects that we've mentioned that we're having on this earth are happening so rapidly that... Of course, things can't keep up. And even animals that should normally be able to evolve and find new niches in this process 
can't because we're changing things so rapidly and then we come in and we're just maybe directly killing them too. We'll just bulldoze all these trees. We ripped them out. Well, sorry, this tree should have evolved to be stronger than a bulldozer, but I guess it didn't. Um, so that idea that that this is a natural cycle, that these things happen, is so far removed from what the actual situation is, is going on that I don't think the rest of that argument is even worth defending. Um, but even if you think that, that, okay, you know, this is something that's going on, whatever, blah, 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 the idea that we shouldn't be responsible for this is also profoundly ignorant in the fact that it doesn't realize how dependent upon we are of all these natural ecosystems, of the ecosystem services they provide, and of the life that makes up these ecosystems for our own survival. If you wiped out all life on Earth well, and, and, and just left humans by ourselves, we would die, basically within a couple of days. We are as dependent upon the life on Earth as the life on Earth is being affected by our actions. And you can't escape that. To add to that, it, it is true in, in a sense that life does adapt, but what has occurred on this planet and especially what will occur is not accurately summed up as change. It's wholesale destruction. So in one sense saying, oh, species will adapt to the change. Well, that's true, but what is the change they are adapting to? The change is that there will be less earth to inhabit. Another way to think about it is like if you took a 10-story apartment building full of people and then just eliminated nine of those floors, would people adapt? Yes, in a sense, if you mean 90% of those people would have to move out. But since in this analogy, the building is the entire earth, there's nowhere else to go and adapting simply means dying. Climate change and habitat loss does not mean that species have to adapt to warmer temperatures and changing weather patterns, they have to adapt to the fact that their forest does not exist anymore, or that the wetland that they evolved in is now a desert. They have to adapt to the fact that the very foundation of their diet, the insects and the things that ate those insects, those have disappeared. That's what we're adapting to, is just destruction. And to piggyback off one thing you said, David, you mentioned we are dependent on ecosystems. We cannot survive without the life on this earth. This is something we touched again on in episode 34, so I won't go you know, too much into this, but we can never stop harping on the fact that biodiversity is what makes humanity possible. We love to think of humanity as this inventive uh, species, and it's true, we do create a ton. We're a very creative species, but it's a mistake to think that our technology and our inventions separate us from nature because it is the exact opposite our inventiveness comes directly from nature. If you took a handful of the world's smartest scientists and you know, gave them all hammers and dropped them on the moon with the instructions to invent food, they'd fail because the moon is just a rock. There's nothing there for them to create with. Our ability to create new things, whether it's food, medicine, construction materials, all of this comes from our ability to combine, reorganize, and play with that which nature freely gives us, right? The genetic engineering breakthrough that was enabled by CRISPR happened because researchers discovered something that a bacteria cell does naturally. The innovation is taking that, cutting it out, and pasting it into something else. We didn't invent anything. <laughs> we, we took something nature invented and applied it to our own use. The acting ingredient in aspirin comes from the leaves of a tree. Our buildings are made primarily of naturally occurring crushed rock. And when that naturally occurring crushed rock runs out, we don't have the economic ability to make our own. And all of a sudden, building things out of concrete becomes uneconomical and unprofitable. Okay, well, enough of this hot seat thing, Daniel. Um, I think we get the point of what you're trying to get across here. And I, I want to turn towards the final part of the report where they try and talk about what can we do, which is the same thing that we try and do on this, this show. So, Daniel, let me just pull this up real quick, the report. We'll navigate to the section where they talk about some of the things we can do. Um, I want to pull up this one here, D2, for those of you reading along, and I don't know why you are. Um, <laughs> the they call this the five main interventions or quote levers that can generate transformative change by tackling the indirect drivers of nature deterioration okay are, are, are you ready for these daniel hit me with lever number one number one incentives and capacity building uh that's that's a little disappointing let's look at number two cross-sectoral cooperation okay well that's a big wet fart number three Preemptive action. 
Well, fucking duh. Number four, decision making in the context of resilience and uncertainty. Did they just literally list out a number that said we should make decisions even though that we don't entirely know what's happening? I guess. Number five, environmental law and implementation. This is my favorite one because I can solve this problem right now with number five. I'm going to propose a law, Daniel, that we make it illegal to uh, kill the earth. Yes. Done. Number five. Check. (laughs) We took care of that. Um, No, but I mean, seriously, these are all just trying to to scapegoat and get around the real problems here. Where They talk about, and they, they go into more depth than this, and I'm selling them a little bit short, and it's not entirely fair for them. But if you go through and you read this section, you can see they're all just very much trying to sidestep around the fact that any real change that we want to do, any actual fixes for these problems are going to be hard and require large systemic change. But they don't actually talk about what that systemic change might be. They don't talk about the actual mechanisms of of implementing that sort of systemic change or even if it's possible in the first place. And remember, this is a, a paper put out by an intergovernmental panel. It's an organization with 130 member states. So these are the governments of the world who are, are coming together to write this, to publish this. And this is the version that is going out for media and policymakers. This is what your politicians are going to be reading. To be fair, we haven't seen the full report. Well, yeah, this, this is actually technically the unedited advanced version. But, I mean, your politician is not going to read the 1500 or 1800 page or whatever it is full version. They're going to read something that is more or less like this advance. That's 39 pages. And nothing is laid out here. Nothing really valuable that could actually put forward substantive change is explained. Because these types of things are hard. These are the types of choices that would have to be made that say, well, you know, and, and, and they do go into a little more detail, but, but it's things like we need to optimize for uh, natural resiliency instead of, and they, they, they never say this in these types of words, but profit-seeking motives. Um, but who's going to be the business or the company that says you're not allowed to do this because even though it serves your profit incentive, it's bad for the earth. Mm -hmm. That is never published on on how that's going to happen, how you're going to change the economic system. It's just suggested that we have to realign our values and whatever. Uh, But that is not how the earth functions right now. That's not how we decided to build this world. Remember what we're talking about. We want a world that is dependent upon want to push things forward. And from that want, we bear cruelty. And that is a fundamental nature of the way that we've decided to interact with each other in the economic system. And in that cruelty, we're being cruel to the earth. We're destroying all this stuff because we have to fulfill those wants. And there is no solution for eliminating that chain, that cycle in this report. Uh, It's just about mitigating it and making it worse. And something that strikes me when I read this to the end is this assumption that we will always be unsustainable and we can just slow down this process. The idea of being sustainable isn't even sort of seriously put forward. And I'm not talking about sustainable and like small notions, but I mean completely 100% sustainable, where we are not taking more than we're giving. But it's possible to give more than you take. There are communities around the world who enrich the soil, who make their environments better. Uh, We've talked about this with some soil builders on the show before. If you remember Chris Del Sandro on here, Daniel, Mm -hmm. way back in episode 16, who spent so much time trying to get carbon back into the soil to make it healthier, to add all these other weeds, things that we would consider weeds, into his ecosystem to make these permaculture forests that that is better than what was there before. And he's the person who is working on trying to give back more than he's taken out of this soil. And, And he does get to take things from it. He gets food, he gets uh, resources, but he puts more back in. And I really like that notion that there is a world that is possible where instead of each one of us taking from the world, where each one of us burns this much carbon, we, where we have a budget where as long as we don't go over this, we won't destroy things quickly. But instead we say, well, here's my negative impact. I'm not harming things and making them better. And, and that's never even part of the discussion anymore because we can't even imagine a world where that's possible, even though, in, especially in, in these indigenous communities, in the small local communities that you mentioned earlier on in this thing, the stakeholders, as they would call them in this report, that exists in many places, but it's not profitable because the profit is based on this extraction, this step from the future that we've talked about, where that's the only way we can get something to actually appear profitable. But in the end, that profit is an illusion. Because nothing is actually profitable unless we are borrowing on the life and the, the health of the earth and of our future. What a beautiful idea, David, the fact that we could give back to the earth more than we take. But you mentioned something about how the, these reports, these types of intergovernmental panels always fail to really push fundamental change to the structures of our, our 
politics, our governments, our economies. Here's something they say from the report. Quote, you can't just tell leaders in Africa that there can't be any development and that we should turn the whole continent into a national park, said Emma Archer, who led the group's earlier assessment of biodiversity in Africa. But we can show that there are trade-offs, that if you don't take into account the value that nature provides, then ultimately human well-being will be compromised. End quote. First of all, uh, laugh out loud at the idea of the Western world telling Africa <laughs> um, that it needs to take into account the value of nature. Meanwhile, the, you know, the entire wealth of the Western world today is financed by the resources that are directly stolen from African land, previously stolen from Latin America, still to this day. So that's a ridiculous statement. But I think there's also this false either or choice being presented here, this false dichotomy of, uh, oh, we can either have economic development or development or growth or good things, or we can just turn everything into a national park. And we can't do that. So we must find some compromise middle of the road. Like you said, how can we preserve profits, right? Um, I want to play another story from Leah Pinneman's talk that kind of reveals a little bit of the, the hypocrisy here. Does anyone here do crop rotation? Yes. I know you're not raising your hand because it's so obvious that, of course, you have to for your organic certification. Um, what do you think this picture is of? Slash and burn, right? So slash and burn is the sort of derogatory name that some folks give to Sweden agriculture. And, you know, I studied environmental science in college, too. So I, I thought it was like the worst thing you could ever do to the land, like, you know, burn it down and then um, rape the soil of its nutrients and all of that. That's really how I understood it. What I didn't realize is that Sweden agriculture in its inception, which was practiced by African farmers as well as indigenous farmers in Asia and on Turtle Island, um, is about, on average, a 26-year crop rotation. So you burn an area, it releases the nutrients, it kills the pests and weeds and pathogens, right? Releases all of that, and then you grow the food for a couple of years. And by the time you make it back in a rotation, it's been almost a generation. The problem is that when you steal people's land and force them into a small territory of marginal soils, and you try to practice Sweden agriculture, you get the environmental devastation that we see all across the developing world because the rotation is reduced to two or three years which is not enough time for that below ground biomass to form, for all that carbon to be captured, for those deep roots of trees to pull up the minerals and really regenerate the soil. But in its inception, this is the proto cover cropping. This is what we do when we have a rotational fallow, right? And we plant legumes in between, is Sweden agriculture. This is an important story because going back to this earlier concept of indigenous contributions to society and our dependence on local knowledge, and land stewardship as a way to slow the trends of this biodiversity loss. We need to restructure the economy. We need to rethink the very foundations of modern life. And this example provides evidence, in my opinion, for that. Because for one, it reveals the flaw of something so fundamental to the modern economy, which is property rights. The Western world entered the African continent with models of economy, of, of organizing, around these hierarchical institutions, around this narrow conception of property rights. And the result is, in this example, the inability for people to continue a holistic and sustainable method of stewarding the land that they have been carrying on for generations and generations. And now, today, when nonprofits and these other do-gooder institutions look at the farming practices of some region they consider developing, and they want to tell these people how to do things better, the great irony they fail to recognize is that it has been that type of direct intervention that has resulted in so many bad land practices in the first place. This whole idea that we shouldn't own property privately, this is an, a universal indigenous concept that's been documented in Russia, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in South America, right here. This very pretty new idea of enclosure came about in the 1400s. Um, we can thank the British for that idea that we should fence everything and own it all by ourselves. But there was a group of black farmers in the 60s who said, how do we take white man's law and make it work for communal land ownership? We really want to figure that out. So they traveled around the world. They studied the kibbutz in Israel you know, and other systems. And they came up with the idea of the community land trust. Community land trust where you have an organization that collectively stewards the land 
but the ownership of the structures, the equity in the structures can be owned by the individual and passed on through generations. Brilliant legal model. There are now thousands of community land trusts and we can thank the Sherrods, Shirley and Charles Sherrod, and the 500 black farmers who founded new communities on 6,000 acres in Albany, Georgia in 1969 for the idea of the community land trust. We're going back to just reinforce what you said, David, new policies, new reforms that will incentivize one thing or another, maybe that will have a mitigating impact in the short term. Maybe there's a way that we can incentivize profit-seeking companies to be a little bit more green. But in the end, that's not going to get us there. That is exactly why we are failing all of these sustainable development goals, all of these plans from these governments, because we are not changing the system in, that is destroying this earth. And so what can we do? Recognize that recognize that our politicians will continue to fail us. Our corporate leaders will continue to fail us. And that the future of this earth is in local, sustainable stewardship of the land. And any way we can support that, encourage that, uh, (laughs) incentivize that, any way that we can be a part of that is a way forward. Whatever that means to you, to each of our ability, to each to their uh, contribution. What's that? What's that quote, David? <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you mean uh, uh, from each according to their ability to each according to their need? There you go. I think. Yeah. I've got another one, actually, Daniel. Um, okay. And this one I've seen graffitied all over New York uh, for the past couple of years. But really, whoever's been doing this has been doing it uh, more and more. And I think it's a great personal mantra to ask yourself all the time. And I know I do every time I see it. And I may have mentioned it on the show before, actually, but it, it's worth repeating. And that's just two statements. Are you helping? Are you hurting? That's a lot to think about. As always, David. But think about it and do something about it. We hope you will. You can read this full, advanced, unedited copy of the report, as well as a couple articles about some of the takeaways from it on our website, as well as the full transcript of this episode at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, joining us at patreon.com slash ashesashescast, Or visiting our sticker store at ashesashes.org. What is it, David? Slash shop. We also have an email address. It's contact at ashesashes.org. We encourage you to send us your thoughts. We read them and we appreciate them. We are also on all your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast, as well as having an awesome Discord community, which you can find a link to on the top of our website. Just click that community button, tap Discord, and you can join us. There's a lot of great discussions that go on there all the time. Daniel and I are there basically every day. Uh, We love our Discord community, and we would love to have you join it too. Next week, as always, we've got another great episode, and we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Has anyone ever heard of permaculture? (laughs) All right, this usually makes me kind of unpopular, but permaculture doesn't exist. (laughs) Permaculture is the theft of indigenous knowledge and rebranding it for profit. One example of, quote, permaculture is the idea of these permanent agroforestry systems. Uh, In Haiti, one of them is called Jaden Laku, but there are many, many dozens of them and they all deserve their own story. So in Nigeria, 26 different agroforestry systems have been documented by Western scientists. I've been trained in Jaden Laku, which is when you put um, you know, beautiful big trees of moringa and limon and um, fruit trees, and then around them you have aromatic herbs for pest repellents, you have um, berries and bushes, you have your annual crops, It's all fenced in with a cactus that's really resilient, and then you can choose when you want to let your chickens in to forage and your goats and when you don't, and so on. This is a nursery that we helped build uh, in Haiti, in the community of Bigone, for people to use for it to replenish their Jardin La Cou, their house garden, and everybody has one. Agroforestry is pervasive. So we can thank black farmers and other indigenous farmers for what we call permaculture.